All right, everybody. Welcome to week four. This is actually my favorite week. So um, this week, our focus is on primarily uh, North America and Africa. And I apologize. I'm going to say right off the bat, probably North America is going to get a little less attention than it normally would uh, because of the condensed format of this class. But one of the things that I have struggled with um, teaching world geography is that usually it's organized um, in a very uh, isolated way. So you do this, you do Europe, then you do former Soviet Union, then you do Middle East, then you do Africa. And all of these has so much in common that, okay, so yeah, there's plenty you can say about this region or that region, but there are issues where it doesn't make sense to talk about it that way. And I think the biggest one for me is the transatlantic slave trade. And I sat down about a year ago and I thought about how many different contexts I've learned about the transatlantic slave trade. So I've learned about it in literature class on African American literature, and I've learned about it in Caribbean history class, and I've learned about it um, doing African geography work, and I've learned about it uh, doing European economics, and I've learned about it uh, in so many different places, but I had never actually had anyone sit down and say, hey, here's the big story. Here's what this was. Here's how it happened. Um, and here's what it actually means for today's world. And it's a big story. And the more I looked into it, of course, I'm a health geographer, so that's where I'm at. But the more I looked into it, the more I realized how connected health and economic exploitation and then these racist, brutal practices that come out of it are connected, okay? So um, we're doing five lectures this week, and each lecture is centered around a pandemic, okay? And we're kind of doing historically. So how did we get our global economic system that we have today? And to do that, we have to go through slavery in the age of exploration. So this first lecture, Act 1, we're talking about the Black Death, okay, the plagues. So before we can talk about slavery, age of exploration, you have to set the scene, right? So the world before 1492, okay, that magic number when Columbus sailed across the ocean and everything sort of changed. So let's start in the Americas. <clears throat> what was going on in the Americas before 1492? Well, there were plenty of people in the Americas. We know that. There were Native Americans and all, and, you know, um, you had hydraulic civilizations, like we've talked about, in um, the Incas and the Aztecs in Central uh, America and South America. North America, you had um, agriculture, but you didn't necessarily have this large-scale hydraulic agriculture, okay? Um, you also had a bunch of people in the Amazon, but of course, we don't have their, it's not as easy to track down their archaeology, um, and so... The rainforest uh, reclaims things. Hold on a second. I gotta take this bone away from my dog. Sorry, buddy, you're getting too loud. Okay. Um, you had a bunch of well-developed causeways, roads. You had well-developed civilizations in the Americas. In North America, you still had a lot of hunting gathering happening in northern North America. You had agriculture, but it was kind of this passive agriculture where you were letting rain, you know, do it. You weren't having these big hydraulic projects in um, the south part of North America. Once you get to Mexico, though, you have what's called developed agriculture, which is really what we talk about when we talk about people settling down. And... Um, if you look at the map, you can see how much more population uh, developed agriculture supports than sort of this passive hunter-gatherer agricultural situation that we had. So, what was going on in Mexico? Well, there were several 
uh, really important, large, developed civilizations in Mexico uh, that kind of culminated in the Aztec Empire, right? So I think most of us are familiar with the Aztec Empire. Um, it's located in central Mexico, okay? Um, uh, the Aztec Empire, its height, controlled 6 million people, so slightly smaller than the DFW Metroplex. But that's still a lot of people for an ancient civilization. Extensive irrigation and canals, so they were very much a hydraulic uh, civilization. You can still see the canals today. Uh, they had a well-developed social system, including compulsory schooling, so all kids were educated. Um, but they also had a lot of eco ecological problems, which you can imagine. I mean, even today, right, if we think about DFW and where we are in this hot, dry kind of situation, um, we have a lot of ecological problems ourselves. And so uh, the Aztecs also had that. And, of course, Mexico City continues to have that. So water scarcity problems, water table problems, deforestation. And one of the big things about the Aztecs was they were big, they were bad, they were fierce, but they were not all that into metallurgy. That wasn't really a skill that um, developed especially the kind of, like, steel for, for warfare. <clears throat> and one of the things that I really want you to keep in mind in this before 1492 space is that the Aztec Empire was already in trouble. The Aztec Empire um, was an empire. Okay, and what that means was they were going out and they were subsuming all of these smaller tribes, smaller states into their empire, right? So if you were in um, Tenochtitlan, you were in the capital and you were full Aztec, things might be all right. But if you were in the periphery, right? So the cities are going to be your core, your Aztec, but if you're in the periphery, these vassal states then you're going to be exploited for the benefit of the core. That's how they had it set up, and people were getting really upset about it. So, of course, um, the Aztecs are notorious for human sacrifices, and they would do that, and they would um, make people, like vassal states, turn people over. But the more common thing was all kinds of taxes, taking their food, um, taking people, not necessarily to sacrifice them, but basically to use as slaves. Um, and so before Europeans got to Mexico, Aztec Empire was already having a lot of political troubles, okay? It's important for me that you know that because one of the things that you need to understand when we go into the age of exploration and then colonialism is that it's much easier to take over a um, civilization that is divided, Okay, so if it is not stable, if it has internal divisions, the number one tool of the colonizer is to go in and exploit those divisions. Okay, and so we're going to see that happen, but not until next lecture. Tenochtitlan, this is the capital city of the Aztec Empire. This is where Mexico City is now. And as you can see, it was in the middle of a lake with all these causeways, and you farm out on these kind of floating farms out into the lake. It was really cool. Um, a really kind of unique way to build a hydraulic civilization. Further south, we go back to the Andes, and there we've got the Incas. Okay, so the Incas are living down um, from uh, Ecuador to Chile. It's actually a 12 million person empire, so twice as large as the Aztecs. There were a lot of Incas, and they tend to live up really high on the mountains, and the best guess uh, that the archaeologists have is that this was related to religion because it's a hard life living up there. You have to control water a lot more. You have to control, um, I mean, the air is strange, right? People have to get used to that. Um, and you have to figure out how to farm up there. And so um, much like we saw in Southeast Asia, the Incas were very into terraced farming, right? You could preserve your soil, you preserve your water that way. It doesn't all just run off. They had an extensive highway and road system running through the Andes, all right, 18,000 miles of roads. Many of these still exist and are still used. Again, a well-developed social system. Um, you actually had uh, 
placement tests for kids, which is a lot more common in Europe and Asia than it is here. Um, but that is another modern thing where you take kids at a certain age and you say, okay, what are your aptitudes? What should we be preparing you for? We don't do that in the United States so much because it's considered um, deterministic. And, um, and we tend to say all kids should get equal treatment until they're 18, whether that's true or not, right? You should be able to pursue your own dreams, not be told what to do. And I think this is a really interesting thing, right? We talked about a couple weeks back how um, tectonically active this region is, right? Lots of earthquakes in Chile, remember? Well, the Incas figured out how to build for that, and they built their buildings without mortar. So if you have your stones mortared together, then they can't move independently, right? And when you have an earthquake, they move together and they crack. But if they're not mortared together and they can move kind of like this against each other, then the building won't fall down. And in fact, um, this is still how, not necessarily without mortar, but the principle of letting your components move independently is still how um, anti-earthquake engineering is done. So when the Europeans came in to Peru, they were like, oh, man, these people are so stupid. They don't even know how to make mortar. Come on, guys, let's build some brick buildings. And they did that. And then the first time an earthquake hit, all of their buildings fell down while all of the Inca buildings stayed standing. Right. That's that indigenous knowledge thing that I, I have emphasized before. and I'm going to say it again. Indigenous people are not magical. Please don't treat them like they're magical. Please don't act like they're magical, okay? That's offensive and weird. What indigenous people tend to have is a knowledge and respect of the land that people who have not been on that land do not have. So it's a longer, deeper version of what I talked about with collective farming where you do not take people off their land because they understand that land in a way that outsiders do not. All right. And so this is an excellent example of how the Incas already figured out how to deal with earthquakes. And then the Europeans come in and they're going to reinvent the wheel. And there was no need to do that, except that things didn't go well for the Incas. But we'll get to that. It's 1492. It's before 1492. They're living in their mountaintop cities. They're not having things fall apart due to earthquakes. The Incas are doing OK. All right. So. Let's go across the ocean and let's go see what's going on in Africa. Um, I'm aware that Africa is probably, for most of you, the least familiar region we are going to talk about. And I love talking about Africa. Africa is my number two um, focus region after the United States, um, which is one of the reasons this week is particularly hard for me because you've got my two favorite things, uh, two favorite regions, but it's going to be okay. I will probably emphasize more African um, information than other regions just because I know that it's a dark spot for a lot of you and that, unfortunately, this might be the only exposure you get uh, unless you actively try to seek out information about Africa, which I advise you to do. Africa is fascinating if you can get past the initial shock of being extremely unfamiliar with Africa. So... We're going to talk about a couple of the empires. So first thing I want you to know is that before 1492, there were lots of empires in Africa. OK, we hear about Egypt and we hear about um, China and we hear about the Aztecs and we hear about the Romans. And honestly, I would be shocked if most of you could name some African empires. OK, or anything about them. So. Um, that's the first thing I want you to understand is that it wasn't like people in Africa weren't also going through all of the same things people in the rest of the world were going through, trying to set up societies. So let's talk about a couple of them. Mali. So Mali's out there in far west Africa, kind of on in what we call the Sahel, which is the transition between the Sahara and sub-Saharan Africa, where it's a lot wetter. So the Sahel is a semi-arid environment. Um, it can be a very difficult place to set up an empire. Um, but 
because of the, the Trans-Saharan trade routes, okay, so remember our trade route map, we'll keep coming back to it, that ancient trade route map. Um, these Saharan empires, while ec ecologically dicey, were extremely wealthy because they controlled salt, gold, all kinds of things coming across, eventually slaves. So the Empire of Mali was run by um, several leaders, of course, but the strongest, richest, most famous was Mansa Musa, this man here, depicted in a European map, okay? Empire of Mali was multi-ethnic, multi-linguistic. This wasn't a tribal empire. This was a lot of different nations. This was a multi-nation state, okay? Islam was the dominant religion. So we talked about the spread of Islam a couple of weeks ago. It spread down into Africa. To this day, you have a lot of Muslims in Africa, mostly um, in the interior areas. So Islam was spread primarily by overland trade routes. And then Christianity was spread by ocean trade routes. So on the coastal areas, you tend to get Christians. And in the internal areas, you tend to get Muslims. There's also a lot of traditional religions that still exist. Okay, that's called the Triple Heritage of Africa. And Mali was famous for gold. It is believed that Mansa Musa was the richest man that has ever lived. Okay, there are stories of him traveling to Algeria and causing a 10-year economic crisis because he just pumped so much gold into the economy that their currency became useless. All right. Mansa Musa became this kind of legendary celebrity figure in Europe. That's why I mentioned this is from a European map. Um, this super rich black king, right? And well, the riches of Africa and why in the medieval era, when you saw all these nativity paintings or whatever, you know, you had the three wise men, one of them was the black king with the gold and all of that, right? Like all of this really went into their imagination, this man, particularly this man, okay? But by 1400, the empire was in decline. Like I said, it's a dicey area. You have multi-ethnic, multi-linguistic. When you have a multi-nation state, it's typically going to be less stable than a nation state. We talked about that last week. By 1433, the nomads had enough of it, right? What's the number one vulnerability of settled people? Nomads can come in and burn your stuff down. And that's pretty much what happened. Timbuktu was sacked by the Tuaregs, and um, you had chaos, and then a new thing showed up, right? That's um, how it works a lot in Africa and in India and in any of these places where you have a lot of people, a lot of different kinds of people living in reforming empires. They form, they fall apart, they reform, they fall apart, they reform, they fall apart, okay? But Mali was probably one of the most powerful. By 1500, it essentially disintegrated. And so you didn't have a huge political bulwark there, okay? So you didn't have a big power that could stop European incursion into Africa, okay? So when the Europeans showed up in Africa, it was during a time of transition for a lot of these empires. Remember what I said about the Aztecs? If you don't have a unified empire or unified state, if there are tr problems within, it's going to be easier to exploit you. You've probably seen the Great Mosque in Timbuktu. This was <clears throat> built by the Mali Empire. Okay, This is considered... Um, really uh, a very important UNESCO heritage site. Okay, um, That speaker was not put in in 1327, though, just so you know. Okay, let's talk about a different kingdom. Let's go down the coast all the way to the Congo River, okay, where the Yellow Empire is, okay? So not a Muslim empire. So the Kingdom of the Congo um, was created through alliances, Okay, so it was a political wheeling dealing kind of deal. Again, it's a uh, multi nation state. It kept expanding through the 1400s, and its big deal was trade. All right, now um, this area, the Congo, kind of equatorial Africa area here, is generally sparsely populated. Uh, it's very dense forests for the most part, and so you had the capital become uh, extremely densely populated. So everybody moves to the capital if they uh, want to live in the city. 
kingdom becomes highly centralized around the capital. This is a pattern that continues to this day in Africa. It's called the primate city. Primate city is the one large city um, where everybody moves to, okay? Um, we don't have that in the United States. We have what's considered a well-developed urban system where your largest, your second largest city is half the size of your largest city, and then your third largest city is a third the size of your largest city. And um, that creates some stability. And that means that one city doesn't have to absorb everybody. It's very difficult for one city to absorb everybody at once. That's how you kind of end up with urban slums. So anyway, you're setting the scene for this highly centralized urban rural dynamic. Um, you have this city that is at the center of a huge trading network that expands across Africa. And it was a manufacturing, okay? So I think one of the things that people tend to think about Africa is that, one, you didn't have these big civilizations, but if you did, well, they weren't at kind of that level that you would expect a real civilization to be at. Like, they weren't manufacturing. They weren't... Well, their industry was ahead of a lot of stuff in um, Europe, actually. So in addition from uh, to the natural resources like ivory that they were harvesting, they manufactured copperware, um, iron goods, that's ferrous metal goods, cloth, pottery, okay? So this was very much like an up-and-coming sort of big city with manufacturing the Congo. Remember the Congo. Now, one of the things that they'll say, and this is very true, is that there was slavery in Africa before the transatlantic slave trade. And, and that is true. You had slaves all over Africa. Um, the kind of center of the African slave trade was actually East Africa. Um, and the big destination, if slaves didn't stay in Africa, was to the Arab world. Okay. So you had about 5 million people moved from Africa into um, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, Iran, Iraq, that area, okay? And we need to talk about the rules for this because this slave trade worked a little bit differently than the one that we're going to talk about in the Atlantic, okay? So you could become a slave as a punishment for a crime as a payment for debt or by being a prisoner of war. Um, essentially, we have a similar system in the United States now. So slavery is illegal unless you're convicted of a crime. And then basically you can use prisoners as slave labor. All right. And currently we have a situation where because immigrants, migrant workers have been um, blocked at the border, we don't have enough people to harvest our food and so we are actually sending prisoners out into the fields to harvest our food. Now, what you probably also know is that our prison population is disproportionately minority um, heavy. And so you have a situation where you've got uh, primarily black and brown people being sent out into the fields to harvest food for no money. That is slavery um, or, you know, 50 cents an hour. So make no distinction about it, we have slavery in the United States, but we have this kind of qualified slavery, like you did something wrong. Whether that's right or wrong, that's the situation. And that's the most common kind of slavery that you'll find in human history. These slaves in this situation had rights, okay? They were not considered property like a horse. They had some human rights. Um, often they could own property. Sometimes they could even hold office. They were usually allowed to raise enough money to buy their own freedom. It was not based on race, and their children were not slaves. This is very important distinctions, okay? So it was still slavery. It was still slave trade. People were still being moved away from their homes, kidnapped, sold for money. No bones about it. That was happening. But the rules and the conditions under which they lived were quite different from what we're going to see 
on the West African slave trade. Okay, the American, Caribbean, South American slave trade. But what this means is that, yes, you do have a lot of African Iranians, African Yemenis. Okay, so 10 to 15 percent of the population of southern Iran is black. And this is something that I don't think is in our geographic imagination enough. And in fact, you have quite a few people who were traded to India or sold to India. So around the Indian Ocean, you have a large African diaspora because of this East African slave trade. Okay. So we talked about the Americas. We talked about Africa. We got one more region. We need to go back and pick up Europe one more time. Okay. So we talked about Europe last week. I kind of blasted through Europe a little bit. Um, but that's because we need to talk about Europe this week in conjunction with this whole story. Okay. Europe's critical. So, in the 1300s, you had a little disease show up called the Black Death, i.e. the plague. Now, bubonic plague, there are three kinds of plagues. Um, bubonic plague is the most common. Bubonic plague um, is carried by fleas that primarily like prairie dogs, um, but other small mammals like rats, okay? So, uh... The plague is native to um, the steppes, so the savanna kind of areas. And there have been all of these um, articles this summer where it's like, plague found in China, plague found in Colorado. There's always plague in Colorado and China, bubonic plague, okay? Always. It lives there. It's part of the system. Um, don't worry about it too much. At this point in our history, bubonic plague is very easy to cure with antibiotics. Now, one of the things about the Black Death was there were three kinds of plagues involved. The other two would kill you within a day. They were very contagious. You could get it from touching someone. You could get it from inhaling the droplets. You could get it from getting bit by a flea. There were a bunch of ways you could get the plague. It's very contagious, very dangerous, and it could kill you very fast. Okay? So the Black Death was a global pandemic. Okay? It started out in the Silk Road, and it hit China first during the 1330s through the 1350s. There is a very good reason why so many of our diseases tend to hit China first. It's just because you have a whole lot of people living in China and always have. You have a lot of people in China, a lot of animals in China. Um, that's it. That's the only reason. There's nothing insidious about it. Just China, China tends to be one of the first places that gets hit with disease. And just like with covid where they're starting to think, well, maybe it didn't actually evolve in Wuhan. It just We just found it there first because it got into a population and was able to grow where we saw it. That's the thing with the Black Death. It's probably not from China. It probably just followed the Silk Road, got into China first, and then followed the Silk Road all the way back over to Europe. Once it got into Europe, within two years, two years, it was pretty much everywhere, okay? That's a very fast spread for something long before we were as mobile as we are now, right? And it went through everything. It went through Turkey. It went through Italy. It went to all parts of Europe, up into the Nordic countries, into Russia. It went south into the Middle East. It went all the way down to Yemen. It hit Cairo. It hit Marrakesh, okay? Very fast this thing spread. And here it is again, just spreading through Europe specifically. Okay. Just how quickly it came through. And um, yeah, it was, a, it was bad. It was a mess. So at this point, let's stop and do a little bit of medical geography background. Important disease terms. An endemic disease is a disease that is always or almost always present in the population. So an endemic disease here in 
Denton would be the cold. Okay, you can get a cold any time of the year. Um, it would be a lot of the STDs. All right, chlamydia, syphilis. It's just always here. Be careful. It's always present. An epidemic would be a higher than expected outbreak of a disease. Okay, higher than expected. So if we had a particularly bad flu season, like we did last year, so the flu is an endemic disease. The flu is always around. But if you have a particularly high season, then that's a flu epidemic, okay? Um, an emerging disease is a disease that has not been seen before in an area. COVID-19 is an emerging disease. We had never seen it except for a couple months ago. Um, and when we did the shutdown, the first shutdown, and you tried to control it, to stop it, what we were trying to do was keep this emerging disease from becoming an endemic disease, and we've probably failed. COVID-19 probably can't be eradicated at this point. Um, CDC has said as much. So we've got to figure out now how to transition from dealing with it like it's an emerging disease to a particularly bad endemic disease. A re-emerging disease would be a disease that's returned after previous successful control efforts. So measles, okay? When people stopped vaccinating or slowed down on vaccinating their kids for measles in places like Southern California, we started seeing measles outbreaks again for the first time in decades. That's a re-emerging disease, something that we had controlled and now it's back, okay? And a pandemic, there are all kinds of official definitions, the woo, the woo, <laughs> the who has for what are different pandemics. But generally speaking, a pandemic is simply an epidemic, higher than expected outbreak that crosses international boundaries, all right? These are important terms. These are my medical geography terms. They're important to me. So the Black Death killed 50 million people in Europe. It is about 60% of the population in about five or six years. Very fast. It had an 80% mortality rate. So if you got sick, you only had a one in five chance of survival. Okay. And you had subsequent waves of it coming back through Europe um, for hundreds of years. And the subsequent waves didn't seem to be as bad as the first, um, but they certainly killed thousands and thousands of people. All right. This is a mass grave that they recently uncovered. Um, you couldn't, that's what the catacombs are for. You couldn't keep up with how many dead people there were. Um, there was no way to do it. So let's talk about the social consequences of the plagues. One, one is that you had physical resistance, okay? When you have something come through and kill this many people, it's a real-time example of natural selection. So you had resistance in survivors, and Europeans that went through this and survived had something almost certainly in their immune systems that helped them get through it because uh, it killed a lot of people. So essentially, the people that survived were much more likely to have immunity to whatever the plague was doing to you. Now, European people at this time generally, because they'd been living through the Dark Ages and on top of each other and next to animals for so long, it was dark, it was cold, it was gross. Europe was gross, all right? We think about it as real fancy, but it was real nasty during this time. It was like this nasty, cold outpost. It was gross, all right? You also had centuries of exposure to tuberculosis, smallpox, cowpox, cholera, rubella, measles, scarlet fever, flu, so the P Europeans that came through all of this had an immune system that was really raring to go against these particular kinds of diseases. Not all diseases, but these particular kinds of diseases. And in fact, we believe that 13% of European descendants actually have natural resistance to HIV because of this. Don't test it. 
It's not you. I promise you're not in the 13%. Do not test this theory. Um, but that in particular kinds of illnesses, European descendants have some protection. We'll come back to that later. The plagues also created a lot of extra wealth. When you have 60% of the population die, that's a lot of property and money up for grabs, okay? And so that extra wealth led to, I mean, Europe going from one of the poorest regions in the world to one of the richest very, very quickly. Just a couple of years, right? You also had a crisis of faith. And frankly, here's the thing, you guys. A lot of this stuff that I have seen in previous pandemics, I'm seeing play out in our modern pandemic as well. You had this idea that, oh, well, the disease was sent for sinners and God will keep us safe. And as the disease wore on, it became very clear that that is not how diseases work. Um, I'm not saying there is no God, but if there is, he wants you to protect yourself from disease. So you started to see bishops get sick. You saw people thinking that going to church was fine and then everyone getting sick at church. You saw the Pope flee um, and self-isolate, socially distance for months and months and months at a time. You started to see people really not believing in God or their faith anymore. And so you started to see social norms um, fall apart as well, because remember, at this point in time, people, there wasn't really school. People didn't go to school. Your whole society, your whole socialization was around your religion. And so this was huge, right? You had the authority figures leaving town, um, including like the police, and you had society kind of falling apart. And you had people who were like, I, I can't keep myself safe. I don't know when this is going to get me. I don't know if I'm going to survive. So I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to go out. I'm going to drink. I'm going to have sex. I'm going to just live it up now because I, I don't feel like there's a plan. I don't feel like there's a future. And I feel like this is the big risk that we're taking um, without having some definite plan to address the pandemic that we're currently in, okay? People became really worried about overpopulation, okay? So again, social distancing is a lot easier when you don't have as many people living on top of each other. This is why we're starting to see um, property rates and rents go down in cities where they haven't done that for decades in the United States, right? People don't really want to live in the cities anymore because if this comes back through or another disease comes back through, it's much harder to keep yourself safe when you're packed in with a bunch of people. My best friend and her husband are renting a house and moving out to the country for the fall because they're so worried about the second wave. This is very much relevant to today's world. And then we get the development of what I call this play suck syndrome. And I feel like we all kind of probably feel that a little bit, right? This is, if I'm living in a place where I'm constantly getting sick, I have to constantly worry about my health. My government doesn't help me. I'm not making any kind of progress on my future plans. Um, people I love keep getting sick and dying. You're going to be a lot more likely to leave that place. And when we talk about all of these Europeans who move across the ocean in the coming lectures, it's important to remember that they still had the memory of Europe straight up sucking bad, okay? And maybe there's something better over there because at least they don't have black death. So because of all this money, that was suddenly out up in the air, um, you ended up with the Renaissance, okay? The Renaissance was what happened after the Black Death subsided. So the plagues allowed for the consolidation of wealth and power in a merchant class that didn't exist before. You had the church and you had like royalty, but you didn't have a middle class. So you had a merchant class, nobility, and then you had the church also becoming richer. Um, but these groups could then sponsor things like artists and educators and musicians, okay? 
One of the reasons you got a middle class was because during the medieval time, you had serious food insecurity. Almost everyone had to be a peasant um, to support what cities there were, right? It was, it was a very basic, right? We talked about social stratification in week two. Europe basically got to go through the social stratification um, experiment after Black Death. Essentially, you had very, you only had a couple of layers before the Black Death, and then with the Renaissance, you got a bunch. So you got middle classes, merchant classes, nobility, artists, educators, uh, all kinds of things, okay? So um, it started in the South, and it spread North. And it also includes uh, the printing press, which was really critical, right? Being able um, to share books, information, literacy. This was a huge leap forward in communication technology. And so while it was beautiful, the things that the Renaissance created, um, and we don't we usually talk about it like, then the Europeans were just suddenly smart and made all of these great things because they were the best people on the planet. That's not what was going on, okay? There was a lot of money all of a sudden. People could do what they wanted to do. If you put a whole bunch of money into any society at any time, you'd be able to get this kind of art and literature and music because that's what humans do if they don't have to labor in the fields or, you know, at Walmart or whatever. So, in 1500, okay, Renaissance has already been in full swing for almost 100 years. Like, you know, a lot of times when you take world history, they're like, 1500, Europe's like, the shit, Europe's really ripping it up. But if we look at this list of the largest cities, only one of the cities is in Europe. It's Paris, and it's number eight, all right? Four cities are in China, so I want us to start thinking about China differently. Don't think of China as an emerging region. That drives me insane. People are like, oh, China's an emerging world power. China is the original world power, y'all. Okay? The original. So China's always been out there, always doing their thing. We're going to get to China. I love talking about China. I love all of this stuff. Um, two in India. Right? Three in the Middle East. This is during the caliphates. This is while you have really high power in the Muslim world. And high literacy and hospitals and all of that, okay? 200 years later, 1700, okay? So 200 years into the age of exploration, you still only have two cities on this list in Europe, okay? You've got uh, two in the Middle East. You've got one in India. You've got three from Japan, which is interesting. So you should be thinking something happened in Japan between 1500 and 1700, and it did. Um, but still, <clears throat> so Europe's maybe not as backwater as it was in 1500, but it's still, you know, not ruling the world or like the most urbanized or rich, whatever. By 1900, however, only one of the world's 10 largest cities is not in Europe or the United States. Fortunes changed radically over this period of time. So how did this happen? How did this happen? And to do that, we're going to introduce the age of exploration just a little bit, and the next lecture will be a lot more about this. But essentially what happens is in 1415, Prince Henry the Navigator, who was the leader of Portugal, was sitting on a pile of plague money, right? Everyone was sitting on a pile of plague money. And Henry says, well, I want to spend some of my plague money. I'm going to give it to this guy with a boat. And I'm going to say, go see what's over there. And like, just tell me what's going on over there. And it makes sense that Portugal would be one of the first people to send out ships because they were a sea, they are a seafaring nation and they're just basically right across the street from Africa. So that was the first explorations where like, go over and tell me more about Africa. What's going on over there, right? That's interesting. I want to know more. So 
if you look at this map, like the first thing out of Lisbon is Madeira Islands there off the north uh, west coast of Africa. And that was the first European, really, settlement in the age of exploration. Look at it. You can't blame them. It's absolutely gorgeous. So they found this place. They went back to Prince Henry. They were like, we found this cool place. He was like, oh, go send some people over there. We'll get some Portuguese people over on the Madeira Islands. It'll be great. And that basically started the whole thing, okay? So as, um, you know, the Portuguese start making contact with more and more of Africa, because they're going in and they're talking to these different um, empires and kingdoms, they come across the kingdom of Benin, okay? Benin is located in modern Nigeria, Benin um, was also very similar to the Congo, uh, uh, manufacturing center, uh, highly developed. They were famous for brass and copper castings, okay? But they didn't have enough raw materials. They didn't have a lot of brass and copper mines. But you know who did? The Europeans. And the Europeans didn't know how to unload all this brass and copper that they had. So... Portugal is like, all right, this is great. This is great. We've got all this brass and copper. No one wants it. In Europe, they want gold and silver because they're all rich, you know, rich bitches now. Um, so they took their, the Portuguese took their brass and copper to Holland. Holland turned it into bracelets for them for a, a cost, of course. Then the bracelets were taken down to the kingdom of Benin where they became a form of currency. So already, you're starting to see how this global economic system is coming together. Oh, we've got three countries involved in this one product now. Benin loved these things, and they paid for it with what they had, which was pepper, cloth, ivory, and slaves. They had some slaves. They gave this package of things to the Portuguese traders. And just like that, boom. Now we've got a global economy and a new commodity, which is human beings. For the first time, Europeans are taking human beings out of Africa as payment. All right. And that's going to set the scene for the rest of our lectures. All right. So I'll see you in the next one.